Good evening. Thank you, Peggy, for that um, very generous introduction. So good evening to all, and thank you for joining us this evening. The exhibition Philippine Gold, Treasures of Forgotten Kingdoms, is the fruit of a lifetime of devotion by two very special families, the Loxin and Sobel de Ayala families, without whose vision this groundbreaking exhibition would not have been possible. I thank Asia Society, the Ayala Museum, and Banco Central ng Pilipinas, or Central Bank of the Philippines, for supporting enthusiastically this collaboration. Also, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Musée du Quai Bronly, the Lilly Library, and the Loxin family for lending important works to the exhibition. I thank in particular Philippine Consul General Mario de Leon, I'm not sure if he's in the audience, Doris Ho, Lloyda Nicholas Lewis, and Fernando Zobel de Ayala for championing this project. It takes a village to bring together such an ambitious exhibition and um, in such a short time. So I do thank my co-curator, Adriana Prozer, who expertly shepherded the project. And yes, we're still friends. <laughs> Exhibition designer, Clay Vogel, who magnificently translated the curatorial vision shown on the right, visiting the Ayala Museum in the Philippines with our dedicated Ayala Museum staff led by Museum Director Mariles Gostilo. And they are here tonight. Many hands, please stand up. Many hands made sure that the multiple complex detail tasks were done. And these include Asia Society's senior registrar, Claire McGowan, who ensured secure shipment and arrival from Manila to New York. Is Claire around? Our skilled mount makers, or I should say the artists, Amy and Beth, who custom crafted each individual mount to create a floating effect that we curators and the exhibition designer envisioned. Also, we tend to forget how much invisible work goes into these exhibitions. Asia Society's Deputy Director Marion Cockott and Publications Coordinator Lisa Hook made sure that the project was on track, that all texts and graphics were designed by Lucille Tanazas and her team were perfect. So um, on behalf of my co-curator Adriana Prozer, our profound thanks to you and to many others too numerous to mention. From my end, I thank Adriana for supporting and co-curating this exhibition. There is a third co-curator that I must mention. The late collector and archaeologist Cecilia Loxin, who together with her husband Leandro Loxin, the Philippines National Artist for Architecture and former chairman of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, assembled and curated the extraordinary gold collection that forms the core of this exhibition. And their son, Andy, is with us tonight. The permanent gold installation of over 1,000 gold objects at the Ayala Museum and this special exhibition in New York would not have been possible without Cecilia Loxin's pioneering scholarship and guiding hand through the last 15 years through all stages of the collections transferred to Ayala Museum in 2006 to its unveiling to the Philippine public in 2008 and the publication of the book Philippine Ancestral Gold in 2011 that we celebrated over roast suckling pig, <laughs> which we probably shouldn't have done. As we reviewed my manuscript for the gold book, it became clear that the most impressive works had come out of Butuan in northeastern Mindanao. In one videotape working session, Mrs. Loxin flew in the king of pot hunters himself, 
who is not pictured here and will remain unnamed. Having retired from the pot hunting business, he was ready to help reconstruct the actual recovery sites, for it was not unusual for pot hunters to deliberately mislead potential rivals by citing the wrong locations. So together we mapped the sites of irregular finds, noting that recoveries were primarily along rivers and coasts, suggesting maritime trade. We published this map of irregular finds in the Butuan area in the book Philippine Ancestral Gold, published in 2011. Note that the Butuan um, culture area is that is associated with the gold finds straddles the present day political boundaries of Agusan del Norte, Agusan del Sur, and Surigao del, del Sur provinces. When compared with the distribution of gold mines in the archipelago on the right, the sites of gold recovery correspond to regions that are rich with gold deposits. The tradition of art collecting, as is known in the Western world, began late in the Philippines. It was only in the 19th century when interest in collecting paintings, books, and manuscripts took hold, primarily as a way of retrieving and reasserting one's national identity after gaining independence from Spain. Through numerous conversations through the years with Cecilia Loxin, she fondly recalled that it was the late artist, scholar, collector, and philanthropist, Fernando Zobel de Ayala y Montojo, who first inspired her to collect with a gift of Chinese blue and white saucer. This became the first export ceramic in the Loxin's internationally celebrated collection of Asian trade pottery. For his part, Zobel established the Museum of Abstract Spanish Art in Cuenca, which you see here, and envisioned the Ayala Museum in the Philippines, Asia Society's partner in this exhibition. Through Zobel's pioneering vision and generosity, Philippine cultural institutions, including Ayala Museum, acquired important collections of 19th to 20th century paintings, manuscripts, and maps. One important map that the Ayala Museum does not have, but would love to have, is the Pedro Murillo Velarde map, which I show you here, published in 1734. The most detailed and important map of its time, it also functioned as a navigational chart. The map records the three main island groups known at the time, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. When Ferdinand Magellan and his men first landed in the central Philippine islands in the Visayas in 1521, they proceeded south to Butuan in northeastern Mindanao, where his chronicler Antonio Pigafetta observes, and I quote, in the island of that king who came to the ship are mines of gold, which is found by digging from the earth large pieces as large as walnuts and eggs, and all the vessels he uses are likewise of gold, as are also some parts of his house. And he was the most handsome person whom we saw. He had very black hair to his shoulders, with a silk cloth on his head, and two large gold rings hanging from his ears. At his side, he had a dagger with a long handle, all of gold. His island is called Butuan. Spanish colonization and conversion commenced in earnest in 1565 after Miguel Lopez de Legazpi and the Augustinian missionary Andres de Ordaneta traveled across the Pacific from Mexico, landing in the central island of Cebu. They reported gold jewelry in astonishing quantities, and when they learned that the heirloom wealth was interred as burial offerings, they sacked the graves. The Spanish controlled Trans-Pacific galleon trade crisscrossed the Pacific between Manila and Acapulco from the 16th to 19th centuries, stretching the previously existing South China Sea and Indian Ocean trade routes eastward across the Pacific to Latin America and thence to Seville. 
galleons carrying Chinese ceramics, silks, ivory, and precious jewels followed the Trans-Pacific route charted by Legaspi and Ordaneta. The late Professor Charles Boxer, after whom this rare and important codex included in the exhibition is named, suggests that this frontispiece portrays the galleon Capitana, anchored off the Marianas Islands before reaching Manila in 1590, bringing the new Governor General Gomez Perez das Marinas from Mexico to Manila. The Boxer Codex is important because it provides clues to how local inhabitants of the islands that we now call the Philippines dressed and used gold ornaments similar to those recovered through controlled excavations and through irregular means. Despite the chronological distance of about 300 years, the sumptuous garments and gold accessories portrayed and described in the codex are consistent with the types of gold ornaments recovered and dated to the 10th to 13th centuries based on associated trade wares. Here we see Tagalog couples, elite Tagalog couples, dressed in silk garments embellished with gold sequins, carrying gold daggers and wearing multiple neck, leg, arm, and ear ornaments, all of gold. The Boxer Codex contains the earliest images and descriptions of local inhabitants and their attire at the time of Spanish contact, descriptions that are reiterated in later accounts such as Successos de las Islas Filipinas, 1609, by Antonio de Morga, who writes, and I quote, the dress and costume of these natives of Luzon before the Spaniards arrived consisted of garments made of kangan, a Chinese cloth. Round their necks are gold necklaces like spun wax. On their arms, they wear wrought gold bracelets, which are very large and made in different patterns. They wear many gold necklaces and have bracelets on their wrists and wear huge wrought gold earrings, besides rings of gold with stones upon their fingers." End quote. Although the illustrations post-date the gold in the exhibition, they are useful in understanding early jewelry traditions erased by the colonial experience. Through almost 400 years of Spanish colonization, local dress gave way to colonial attire based on Western fashion, but using local materials such as the sheer embroidered pineapple silk fibers or piña that you see here. Syncretic colonial dress eventually became the collective idea of Philippine national dress with the indigenous styles portrayed in the Boxer Codex fading from memory. Pre-colonial pre gold that survived colonial plunder were likely melted and refashioned into Christianized jewelry such as these necklaces that you see inspired by the Catholic rosary. These became important components of what is now considered national attire, again contributing to the collective erasure of sophisticated pre-colonial culture. With early gold working traditions largely forgotten, gold jewelry discovered in shipwrecks in the 20th century were often assumed to be a foreign manufacturer. For example, this gold loop-in-loop -loop chain here that was recovered uh, from the galleon San Diego sunk by the Dutch near Manila in 1600. Gold objects, some of probable um, Philippine manufacture, were recovered from the wreck in 1992. On the right are gold chains of unknown provenance recovered from another galleon, the Nuestra Señora de la Concepción, along with 999 gold filigree buttons of the type made for export by Filipino and Chinese merchants and goldsmiths. Excavated in 1988, the Concepcion had sunk near the Marianas after departing Manila in 1638, laden with ceramics, silks, ivory, and jewels. The earliest documented gold objects in the exhibition 
were collected by the French naturalist Alfred Marsh in 1881 from burials in Marinduque Island. It is noteworthy that these 19th century finds are similar to later finds from the 1960s and 1981. In an effort to recover um, objects within the archaeological context, the Loxin Foundation sponsored the Northeastern Mindanao Archaeological Project led by American archaeologist Warren Peterson in 1981. Peterson's team recovered six burials at the Masago site near present-day Butuan City. Associated Chinese trade ceramics and radiocarbon dating of charcoal samples indicated approximate dates between the 10th to 12th centuries. The gold ornaments discovered were similar to irregular finds by treasure hunters in nearby areas. And I might point out, this was the burial of a warrior with a, an iron spear still st uh, stuck through the eyes um, beneath these gold eye covers. Shortly after Peterson completed excavations in Masago, a spectacular gold hoard, subsequently nicknamed the Surigal Treasure, trickled out of the nearby hamlet of Magroyong after a heavy machinery operator who was working in an irrigation project accidentally discovered glistening gold objects scattered among the soil fill sliced off from a nearby mountaintop. As word spread, Intensive looting destroyed valuable archaeological data. It is significant that the so-called Surigao treasure did not come from burials and were not grave offerings, but appeared to have been deliberately hidden in a mountaintop site, perhaps in response to some external threat. The vast array of gold objects suggests that they did not belong to a single individual, but rather to several persons of varying height, weight, gender, probably part of an elite ruling family's heirloom wealth, or Bahandi. The identity and fate of this elite family who presumably owned the treasures are unknown. Formal and technical convergences with neighboring gold-working traditions, notably Java in Indonesia, strongly suggest intercultural connections. When the Loxin collection, including stunning objects from the Surigao treasure, was transferred and installed at Ayala Museum in 2006, my immediate task was to develop a framework for classifying this assemblage of more than 1,000 gold objects. So I grouped the material according to four overlapping categories of form, function, technology, and provenance. I developed a provenance map providing an overview of the distribution and relative concentration of finds. Irregular recoveries span the length of the archipelago, as you see here, with the largest corpus from Butuan in northeastern Mindanao. But gold is recovered in many other areas within the archipelago. The wide distribution of diverse types of penannulars used as barter rings and ear ornaments is striking. Examples from Marinduque, Mindoro, and Mindanao Islands are in the trade section of the exhibition, which is the first section that you will encounter as you walk into the gallery in the second floor. In contrast, golden waistbands with granulated repousse buckles occur only in Butuan area in Mindanao, and as you can see, they're of different lengths and different sizes. Ear ornaments with distinctive spangles called kayong kayong are limited in the central Visayan islands. In contrast, orifice covers for funerary purposes, um, including eyes, nose, and lip covers, are widely distributed with the largest recovery from Mindoro Island in Luzon, near Luzon. This example is from Butuan in Mindanao. Partial face covers are widely distributed, while funerary diadems and full face masks occur primarily in Butuan. Within the larger Southeast Asian context, 
Gold funerary masks are not unique to Butuan, for related funerary covers occur among many other Southeast Asian cultures, for example, in Vietnam um, and the Cambodia area, as well as Java and Sulawesi. Cord weights are among the most widely distributed, occurring throughout the archipelago and beyond. Their diversity suggests multiple workshops possibly supplying different markets. Itinerant goldsmiths might have played a role in its widespread distribution. It is recorded, for example, that the people of Bicol region in the southeastern Luzon were um, traders and goldsmiths and warriors who traded by land and sea with their goldsmiths traveling from place to place. Similar objects have been recovered from Borneo and Java as well, which you see on the right. The exhibition includes one example from Java as comparison. These objects perplexed scholars in the past and were erroneously thought to be ear ornaments or hair ornaments. But as we see in the Boxer Codex, clearly these gold ornaments were depicted as weights or decorative finials um, for cord uh, waistbands. Many objects relate to Hindu Buddhist traditions, such as the Garuda, the mythical mount of the Hindu god Vishnu. Garuda ornaments recovered from Eastern Visayas are embellished with distinctive spangles, as you see on the left, while those from Butuan in the center and right closely resemble Javanese versions. Links with Hindu culture are also suggested by caste rings with stylized engravings of the Sanskrit symbol Shri, signifying good fortune, such as on the left and center, which are comparable to engra engraved rings from Java on the right. Examining distribution patterns can provide valuable insights into patterns of inter-island and inter-regional trade. Objects of limited distribution, for example, suggest cultural preferences that help define group identities, while wider distribution patterns suggest widespread movements of objects and peoples, perhaps merchants, missionaries, craftsmen, or immigrants, generating similar forms, possibly from multiple sites of production. I also examine the objects according to their function. There's a variety of head ornaments for elite individuals. Ear ornaments were worn in various ways, as earplugs, for example, um, inserted into distended earlobes, or as danglers through uh, pierced ears, or as ear cuffs. Their shapes and configurations suggest various ways of attaching to the earlobes. Very contemporary. Um, <laughs> probably similar to the ways multiple earrings were traditionally uh, worn in India, such as on the left. And on the right, we have, oops, sorry. On the right, we have um, rare cabochon uh, amethyst cabochon ear cuffs that are exhibited publicly for the first time. High-ranking men wore gold bangles around their wrists and ankles, biceps, and the calves below the knee. Here. And when I first saw this, I thought, wow, this, somebody has a large arm. I was trying to put it in my arm, but for the, it's for the legs. Arm ornaments, such as this shimmering cuff with tubular beads, proclaimed one's affluence and prestige. This massive ceremonial cord, or upavita, weighs almost 10 pounds. In traditional Hindu society, the upavita symbolized purity and rebirth and was worn only by the Brahmin class. It is significant that this one object alone is three times more than the total weight of over 1,000 gold objects that were found in the site of Ok Eo in Vietnam, which is the site of the, the earliest Southeast Asian kingdom, Funan, circa 1st to 7th century. 
So the archaeologist John Mixick suggests that Okeo might have been actually importing gold from the Philippines centuries before Spanish colonization. Similar massive gold ornaments are illustrated in the Boxer Codex. The gold sash consists of an inner gold chain encased on four sides by an outer skin of segmented beads woven in place by loop-in-loop -loop chains and gold wires. See here the inner loop-in-loop -loop chain and um, everything is gold and that's why it's um, so heavy. Now in this exhibition we are pleased to reunite for the first time these two parts of the golden sash which were separated by pot hunters in 1981 with a chain ending up at Ayala Museum and the finial, the pronged finial that you see here, ending up at the Banco Central ng Filipinas. So um, we're actually still looking for the ruby cabochon that <laughs> used to be there and might be in someone's uh, necklace somewhere. So I've noted a number of um, objects and adornments with links to Hindu traditions. And it's noteworthy that the 10th to 13th century golden sash from the Philippines is similar in form to this traditional silver loop-in-loop -loop belt from India, which is much later, possibly a cultural survival from ancient Hindu jewelry traditions. Ritual implements include gold vessels of various shapes and sizes, such as small open vessels, um, jarlets, covered boxes, and large containers of hammered gold were likely used for ceremonial purposes. Systematically grouping the objects according to function provides a useful database to aid in reconstructing, reconstructing early social structures. For example, the Butuan data suggest a stratified society although it is unclear whether early Butuan was a chiefdom or a kingdom, as described in early Chinese accounts, such as the Songxi or the history of the Song Dynasty, and why it disappeared from the archaeological record around the 13th century. A third strategy that might be useful is examining the technologies employed in the manufacture of the gold works. Alloys and goldsmithing techniques are often site and time specific and might therefore provide valuable clues to the geographic provenance and dating. So when I was at the um, when I was a scholar at the um, in residence at the Getty, I collaborated with a conservation scientist, Alessa Gambardelli, at the Getty Conservation Institute to identify the elemental composition of gold beads and to gain insight into the construction methods. So using the X-ray fluorescence or XRF spectroscopy, Alessa examined the gold beads formerly in the Loxin collection. Um, so this is what we found. Um, spectroscopy of a small diamond-shaped bead revealed high gold content with traces of silver and copper. It also showed that the bead was not cast, at, as you would see um, with the naked eye, but actually hammered into a strip that was then folded, almost like origami, in, to the desired shape. We also looked at granulation. Um, recent research on ancient Javanese gold indicates that the usual solder of low-melting tin or lead was not used in the early gold of Indonesia. So I wanted to check if this was also the case in the Philippine material. I wanted to compare this, compare this information with the Philippine material. So spot scanning, where the granule was fused to the base sheet, revealed also um, here the absence of solder. There was only um, silver, copper, and gold found in that spot again consistent with early Southeast Asian material. A third spot we checked was um, scanning the area where the braided filigree joined the beads together. So what we found was, again, the absence of solder in the joined spots. And here we only found um, copper and gold without the silver. 
Time constraints prevented a more thorough examination, but we generated enough basic information that confirmed the wonderful potential of scientific analysis to illuminate the gold and in the future to compare the Philippine material with a larger database from other geographic areas. Besides scientific analysis, um, visual examination of the modes of manufacture suggests that casting gold alloyed with other metals, such as this horn-shaped ring, appears to be the least common production method in this corpus of, of gold. In contrast, hammering thin sheets of pure and high carat gold using repose and chasing techniques, such as these chastity or modesty covers, was most the, the most widespread method. The wealth of fully developed gold works recovered from different sites throughout the archipelago and the rich, rich vocabulary for metallurgy and goldsmithing suggest a long tradition of gold working. Many objects display extremely fine granulation, such as this uh, necklace finial. And we have magnifying glasses upstairs in the gallery, so you actually look at this astonishingly fine granulation. We also see this in uh, this U-shaped ornament of unknown use, probably for the ears, uh, with granulation of different sizes, also filigree, a filigree border. Another interesting um, type of production, we have the so-called gear beads, which were made by fusing individual granules to form beads that interlock perfectly when strung together with a loop-in-loop -loop chain, such as this detail that you see here, which is actually the largest example known. And you can see it in person upstairs. You have uh, the loop-in-loop -loop chain with the individual granules that uh, comprise the, they're fused together to create these beads. Gold chains are among the most valued forms of wealth. The number and quality of neck chains signified one's wealth and status. Most of the neck chains recovered are loop-in-loop -loop chains of different lengths and thicknesses wrapped multiple times around the neck to convey one's prestige and wealth. These chains have a distinctive square section produced by linking together, uh, sorry, linking together previously uh, prepared loops, as you see here. And so this is what gives them this uh, squared profile. The complex loop and loop technique is also used to manufacture this really stunning gold belts from Butuan. The woven sash with the segmented gold beads and alternating beads of loop and loop ribbons is fastened by uh, these granulated buckles and you have these alternating bands of a finely woven uh, gold uh, links. The belts are so finely worked that they resemble woven textiles. The geometric motifs are even similar to textile patterns as well, as you see here. Another technique used is cut work and open work, combined with incised outlines, which were also employed, such as this detail of an open work vessel that I'll discuss uh, further below. Now I want to um, go to another uh, category um, that I developed, which was looking at the forms themselves, uh, that iconography. So the forms represented in the exhibition include basic geometric shapes and floral and vegetal forms, such as you see here. You'll also note zoomorphic uh, images on the belt buckles upstairs, including octopus, jellyfish, and bird patterns. So make sure you go around with your magnifying glass so you can appreciate the diversity of these designs. This remarkable openware container, part of the so-called Surigao treasure, portrays Chinese mythical creatures, the phoenix on one side and the kilin on the other side. The kilin and the phoenix occur frequently on Chinese ceramics and textiles. Kilin images are portrayed on Chinese trade pottery found in the Philippines, such as this Ming blue and white jar from the San Diego shipwreck that I mentioned earlier. 
The medallion and cloud patterns framing the keylin on the ceramic vessel on the left are echoed in the openwork designs of the gold vessel on, uh, on the right, as you see here. Although this comparison is from a later period, earlier Chinese iterations of related themes are known. Um, in an essay in the forthcoming issue of Orientations, my co-curator Adriana Prozer suggests a closer look at related gold traditions in the 10th to 12th century Liao Empire of China. So make sure you get your copies. Anthropomorphic images survive largely in Mindanao, Island, where Spanish intervention was least successful. In contrast to the Christianized areas of Luzon and the Visayas, where pre-Christian images were burned or looted from burials. Images of human figures with upraised arms appear in a variety of objects, on ritual plaques, necklace finials, and this hammered gold strip of unknown use also exhibited publicly for the first time. And I don't know if you can make out the um, human figure from where you are. I've outlined it here is an orange figure with uh, extend elongated upraised arms here. Um, and he's usually flanked by two birds. Here is a sketch by Cecilia Loxin. Um, this is only a fragment of the piece. There are three of these orange figures flanked by these uh, birds, also alternating with tree of life motifs that are quite reminiscent of traditional textile motifs in Borneo among the Ibandiak. So there's a kind of a very intriguing connection there somewhere. Another enigmatic figure with upraised arms is this unidentified female image wearing an elaborate headdress with hooked and curled appendages, and again, um, the tree of life motif. And I'll show you a sketch, again, by Cecilia Loxin. Um, florets adorn her diadem. Uh, her ears are distended, indicating high rank. Um, Repose patterns portray jewelry types similar to those recovered from the area, which is also included in the exhibition. Here you have the Suso necklace. You have her upraised arms holding implements that could be a ritual gesture or perhaps identifying attributes. This exquisite gold vessel in the shape of a kinari in Indian mythology, a composite celestial female with a human head and torso and legs and wings of a bird. She's associated, you've seen her everywhere. You've seen her um, on Park Avenue. She is associated with music and personifies the feminine ideals of beauty, grace, and accomplishment. The function of this object is unclear, but a similar vessel from Java, also in the exhibition, provides some clues. Slightly larger than the gold kinari, the bronze vessel lamp from Java on the right uh, is from about the same period. The recovery from Butuan of a Kinari figure, along with Garuda and other Hindu-related imagery noted earlier, is significant for it stretches the boundaries set by scholars, demarcating the spread of Hindu and Buddhist uh, religions in Southeast Asia, which normally exclude the Philippines. This map, for example, shows the spread of Buddhist influence in the 11th century in brown. Of course, um, excluding the Philippines in beige and much of Borneo. The strongest evidence of Hindu Buddhist presence in Butuan is a gold seated figure popularly called the Agusan image that is now in the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. This small female figure was found in 1917 by a local resident near the Agusan River when heavy rains washed it ashore. The cast solid figure is about five inches high, it's not very large, weighs more than four pounds. She's seated with legs folded in the Vajrasana or diamond position with a two feet resting on the thighs. Her arms are akimbo with fingers curled inward the back of her hands resting on the hips. She wears a long chain that circles around her torso and crisscrosses at the back. 
The identity of this image has been debated for decades. Butuan residents today fondly call her, but mistakenly call her, the Golden Tara of Agusan, refer referencing an, a Hindu goddess. The Agusan image actually exhibits iconography that is closely related to Nganjuk images from Java, as you see here, identified as figures from a three-dimensional Buddhist mandala of the type known as Vrajradhatu, or Diamond World Mandala. And I'd like to acknowledge that the first person who actually, the first scholar who actually called my attention to the possibility that this could be part of a mandala is actually here, uh, Dr. Jan van Alphen. Um, thank you so much. That was like 20 years ago, I think, that we were talking about this. So figures in such tableau are in graduated sizes according to their relative importance and arranged in a very specific way. The similarity of the Agusan image to the Nganyuk figures strongly suggests that it was part of a larger set. In a series of personal correspondences um, the last five years or so with Tibetan scholar Rob Linroth, he identifies the Agusan image as one of the four inner offering goddesses named Vajralasya, the gesture of love, who is always shown with her hands on her hips and sits in the southeast corner of the inner circle. So she's not Tara. Her name is Vajralasya. The recovery in Butuan of a Buddhist offering goddess, which is most likely part of a larger set, is intriguing. One wonders whether the anonymous ruling elite with whom the spectacular Surigao treasure is associated might also have links to the gold Vajralasya and the missing three-dimensional mandala of which she was part. Adoption of an imported religion by local rulers is a well-known practice in Southeast Asia. Scholars note that Southeast Asian rulers adopted Indic names gods and language to their ad own advantage to enhance their status. In a Philippine context, it is documented that in the Songshi, that in 1011, the king of Butuan had already adopted the impressive Indianized name Sri Bata Shaja. Gold objects recovered from Butuan suggest familiarity with Hindu Buddhist concepts and Chinese mythology that, coupled with autochthonous traditions, produced a syncretic visual culture. More than 100 discarded clay crucibles used in melting and processing gold, together with worked and unworked gold scraps excavated from Butuan, suggest local goldsmithing activities. Material evidence of extensive commercial activities in the area include Chinese trade ceramics from the 10th to 13th centuries that were excavated by the National Museum of the Philippines in the 1970s in association with a flotilla of pre-colonial wooden boats called Balangay, yielding diverse radiocarbon dates ranging from the 4th to 13th centuries. The sophisticated and intercultural references evident in the pre-colonial gold suggest a long tradition of inter-regional exchanges linking to a larger global network where forms, ideas, and technologies circulated through centuries of multi-directional exchange. An interdisciplinary inquiry would greatly enhance our understanding of early Butuan and other polities in Luzon and the Visayas and their relationship to Java and other neighboring cultures and their role in the maritime trade network linking the Philippine and Java Seas to the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean and beyond. Centuries before the celebrated galleons of Manila crisscrossed the Pacific, stretching the existing trade routes eastward in full circle in a vast global network. Centuries before Western colonization, Early inhabitants of the riverine and coastal areas of the Philippines actively participated in international trade, closely engaging Hindu-Buddhist neighbors in South and Southeast Asia, ostentatiously, ostentatiously displaying their wealth and sophistication 
through fine garments and sumptuous gold adornments. The exhibition Philippine Gold Treasures of Forgotten Kingdoms presents tangible traces of this forgotten past, lifting the gossamer layers of collective colonial amnesia to restore national remembrance of a golden past before Islam and before Christianity. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, for that enlightening look at these beautiful objects, um, their provenance, history, geography, and importance. Okay, and once again, uh, may I acknowledge and thank our colleagues from the Ayala Museum and Marales uh, Costillo, who are here. Thank you so much for your trust. We promise to take good care of these things.